Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to come here uh, to speak at St. Paul's. I've never been in this southern parts of Westchester County. He insists they are not part of New York City uh, for whatever reason. Uh, it's a wonderful sight, and thank you all for coming out. And uh, uh, one of the reasons why I'm doing this with the two glasses so my children can have something to say about we told you not to do that. Now. Uh, Minimalist, I don't need to uh, do you know, bells and whistles. The topic of what I'm be talking about is Hessian savages, frog-eating Frenchmen and virtuous Americans, how personal experiences change time-honored perceptions. And I think that's kind of a bold statement because it assumes that personal experiences will change time-honored perceptions. Is it true? Can personal experiences change time on perceptions? Do they for the short term, for the long term? Uh, how long lived are prejudices, preconceived notions, perceptions? Uh, can we change them for individuals only or for a nation as a whole, the French or the Germans or the Americans, etc.? And uh, I, at the end, uh, you may ask yourself uh, and provide to yourselves an answer to all of these these questions because I think uh, when you look at that title I think it speaks to or I assume it speaks to all of you because uh, most of you have heard of Hessian savages or heaven Hessian mercenaries or French frog eating Frenchmen I'm or Dutch treat etc we have certain preconceived notions that we connect with certain people, with certain uh, nationalities. And I think they, uh, these applicate these, these adjectives that go with nationalities of people uh, all bring up some connotations, uh, positive or very often negative in people's minds. And, and we all know that we could extend this list to include other national, ethnic, racial groups, uh, whether we like or not, because we all look at the world around us through lenses, uh, lenses which uh, determine uh, how we see the people around us, people that we uh, live in. These, you know, these preconceived notions, these prejudices, these ideas can be based on uh, based on skin color, ethnicity, race, religion, a combination of both, such as anti-Semitism, sometimes uh, social origin, social background uh, comes into play. Alexander Hamilton, for example, is born out of wedlock, and John Adams always recalled him a bastard brat of a Scottish peddler. In other words, there are many sources and many justifications for how we look at other people uh, around us. But what is important is that virtually all of those preconceived notions, these ideas about other uh, people, are formed in our minds beforehand without adequate evidence, without forethought, without knowledge, and they can very easily develop into into set ideas about other peoples uh, and other groups of people. Notions about other people that as a rule are not based on actual experience. And what I want to do today is take this general set of how we look uh, or tend to look at the world around us back 250 years and in the time of the American War of uh, of uh, independence and see where those preconceived notions, these prejudices uh, that Americans from, a, from, the, from an English background, that most of the colonials at the time have an English or Scottish background, where these notions come from and maybe help and explain why they survive, uh, some of them, until this uh, very day. So what is the context of the in within which I want to look at uh, the views that 
colonial Americans or Americans, America is not a colony anymore after the 4th of July, 1776, uh, where, what is the historical context within which they look at these two uninvited or invited guests that come, whether they have come as friends in the case of the French or as enemies in the case of the Hessians. Because the years between 1776 and 1783 are the only time in American history uh, in which large numbers of foreign troops fought on America's uh, soil. Uh, those two groups came at different times in the war. They came for different reasons and purposes and goals. And what I want to look at is the expectations both of the groups that come, what do they know about America? What they, do they know about Americans? And vice versa, what do Americans know or think they know about these invited or uninvited guests? And where do those uh, preconceived notions come? Because it's those preconceived notions of what you think you're going to encounter that determine the reaction of people's during the first encounter, be it 1776 or 1780 for the French, and see how, if at all, these notions are changed through precon preconceived, uh, through, through personal encounters uh, in along, the, along those four years or longer that they are over here. Looking at the, at the Hessians first, obviously their point of view, thank you, their point of view is heavily uh, geared toward British loyalist uh, uh, points of view. And how could it be otherwise? Uh, the, their rulers made uh, contracts with the King of Britain. The local propaganda, the local newspapers, all are favored or are leaning toward uh, uh, the British point of view. And so few, uh, if any, British uh, uh, Hessian and Hessian now is a general term for the Brunswickers and every, for all the other principalities that they come from. Uh, few, if any, of the, the mostly noble members of the officer call question uh, why they are coming over here. Uh, they have no problem with this helping the King of England to reestablish the God-given order uh, uh, that, they, that they live in and to force uh, Americans back into uh, obedience in the submission to King George III. On the 4th of July, 1776, on the eve of departure, Lieutenant Andreas Wiederholt of the regiment von Knüphausen writes to his friend, and I quote, my profession and my duty demand of me to risk my life in the service of my master, and I am ready to fulfill this duty. Quite simple, that's what I'm doing. And uh, uh, another uh, officer in the regiment, Losberg, writes, after the rebellious colonists of North America had taken up arms against their lawful master, the King of England, a corps of Hessian troops was taken into British pay, and no one found fault with our going into the British service for pay. There's no reflection as to where they're going. And uh, if those are the officers, uh, among enlisted men, there's even less reflection of why they're coming over here and what they are doing in Ansbach Bayreuth as a 22-year-old uh, soldier named Stefan Popp, who, who writes on the eve of departure on the 2nd of February, 1777, some were glad that they should go out into the world, and I, for my part, was also glad for already since my youth I had a desire to see the world, join the army, see the world. I mean, things don't change all that much uh, very often. And then upon, a, upon arrival in New York City in August, he, uh, the same man expressed his confidence, again I quote, God will continue to shelter and protect us on the solid ground when we march against our enemies. Nowhere is there will you find a word about who this enemy is, uh, why they had come over here, why they're fighting uh, uh, at all. And if they know very little about, about why they're going here, they know even little about America, about the country, uh, of course, uh, that they have been sent to fight. Uh, throughout the 18th century, the, uh, the Pennsylvania Dutch 
the Palatinates uh, when you look at their, their letters and their applications for emigration. They want to go to the island of Pennsylvania or into the New World or something like that. They have no idea what this is or how far it is. And the, the troops that are coming uh, in 1776, 1777, not just as much or as little. Upon arrival in Canada, a uh, man named Julius Vosmus, who's a surgeon for the Brunswick troops, uh, writes, the Spanish possessions in South America are called New Spain. Our men often talk with one another about this part of the world and firmly believe that Spain borders on America. They confuse the European Spain with the American and think it's possible to get from Spain to France and then further to Germany by land. And this erroneous belief tempted some to desert, but they could not even get out of Canada. Surprise. Uh, this is just one example of, of how really blank the knowledge of this geographically, uh, linguistically, of course, and politically, the majority of the enlisted men, uh, men is. Now they get over here, and once fighting starts in August of 1776, we read in many accounts, uh, Hessian accounts, that Americans... Uh, the moment the Hessians showed up, Americans threw down their arms and simply uh, ran, ran away. Uh, uh, why is that? Why do they run away as soon as the fighting starts? And here we see the power of perception, the power of an image of the Hessians that is created, uh, that is created by American propaganda in 1770. 1776. One prisoner told this Lieutenant Wiederholt, whom I already uh, quoted, he told him that there the American generals and officers had told them that we would not treat them in a humane way once they became our prisoners. They would immediately hang them, scalp them, and cut up all their members and commit similar cruelties. Really. Uh, where does this come from? Well, it comes from the fact that once King George III had decided to use force to suppress this American rebellion uh, in, in August 1775, and in the knowledge that Britain doesn't have enough land forces to suppress this rebellion, to hire foreign troops to increase the, uh, the uh, land army, the land forces of Great Britain, and there, behind you, there is one of those uh, Hessian uh, grenadiers there. Uh, <clears throat> not surprisingly, in England, when this happens, in England, uh, a, uh, the decision to hire foreigners to f wage or to fight a war in the New World raises howls of indignation by the opposition to Lord North, of course. The foundation of this opposition, however, is the fact that the British opposition intentionally and for political purposes labels these Hessians that are common as mercenaries. That's intentionally misleading, and they all know it because a mercenary is an individual who hires himself out to a foreign power. The British don't do that. There for decades, and many European powers, the Dutch and the French as well, have hired complete regiments, already established regiments, and these regiments are told you're going to America or you're going to Egypt or wherever you're going to Russia. This is not an individual soldier's decision where he wants to go, by intent, but by intentionally misrepresenting the issue uh, behind it, the opposition in the House of Commons then clamors that foreign mercenaries will be used against fellow Englishmen. And that's the other important point in this, because foreign troops will fight against fellow subjects of the King of England, and you just don't do that. Richard Bull, for example, said in the House of Commons, let not the historian be obliged to say that the German slave was hired to subdue the sons of Englishmen and the sons of freedom. Uh, 
Charles Pratt, the first Marquess Campton, in late November 1775, labels a plan to hire Hessians a sale of human blood, and the soldiers are devoted wretches thus purchased for slaughter. And I'm looking at these notes up because I'm using quotes and I don't want to uh, say something that uh, my Lord Campton never said. An irate William Pitt, the younger, the first Earl of Chatham, charged that the decision to hire foreigners would unite Americans in their opposition and lead to defeat. And he's very, he's very uh, looking forward in there. He says, if I were an American as I am an Englishman, while a foreign troop was in my country, I would never lay down my arms. Never, never, never. And that too probably conjures up in the minds of some of you another famous Englishman, Winston Churchill, right? Because he too said in June of 1940, we shall fight on the beaches and on the landing grounds, etc. We shall never surrender. That's the same kind of spirit that's in there with Lord Pratt in 1775. If these are the words that are coming from out of England, it's quite natural that Americans over here, given especially in New England, their English tradition and background and family connections would pounce on these reports, not just of the negotiations with the Hessian uh, and other princes, but also pounce on these words that are being uh, used by the opposition uh, to, uh, to uh, King George and Lord North. Newspapers in particular pounce on these, uh, on these issues and print mostly anonymous letters denouncing King George. George. The Pennsylvania Patriot, for example, laments that the king had hired foreigners, Hessian barbarians, to institute tyranny and despotism, to enslave their own people. And these are recurrent themes in the spring of 1776, because the, the news that these uh, treaties had actually been signed doesn't come over here until May of 1776. We are still in the run-up to the Declaration of Independence, uh, obviously. Uh, Thomas Paine, well-known Thomas Paine, writes uh, to the, to the uh, Pennsylvania newspapers, the king had sent armed troops to kill, lay waste, and spread desolation by fire and sword from one end of the colonies to the other. Uh, another uh, letter reads that the king was hiring soldiers from the most barbarous nation in Europe and with at least 20,000 savages to complete the intended massacre. Another uh, newspaper in Boston talks about the king having hired Russians, Hanoverians, Hessians, Canadians, savages, and Negroes to assist them in burning your towns, desolating your country, butchering your wives and children. They will be not be safe from the unholy violence of mercenary soldiers rioting through every corner of the land, insolent in victory and barbarous in defeat. You get the picture. I could get you. There's all dissertation just about this out there where you can get quotes from a newspaper in Boston all the way down to Charleston. This is colony-wide, this, this anti-British, anti-Hessian uh, propaganda against these people from the most barbarous nations will, who will come to assist the king uh, to ravage our frontiers of murder in the most un inhuman manner, our defenseless wives and children for a small reward of sixpence. That this serves a political purpose is very obvious when you look at the Declaration of Independence. Because one of the points raised in the Declaration of Independence that the king has at this time is at this time transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the work of death, desolation, and tyranny already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy scarcely parallel in the most barbarous ages, etc. 
in other words, what there's a purpose behind this. If you want to, and the Declaration of Independence is a list of grievances, all the things the King of England has done or not done, and bringing foreign mercenaries into, in, into the United States is one of the very strong uh, points uh, that is being raised. You want to come in? Okay. One of the points that are being raised. The, the question, of course, is does anybody believe this? Does anybody believe this propaganda of these savages, of barbarous uh, Hessians coming in? And the answer is, you bet. It works beautifully. Uh, Pennsylvania, Alexander Graydon, for example, who was taken prisoner outside New York City in, in April 1770, in August 1776, describes his captors as much of a brute as anyone I've ever seen in human form and I regarded this despicable wretch with the same indifference that I should have viewed a caged wild beast, though with much greater abhorrence. Where is he from? Pennsylvania, right? Could he ever possibly have seen a German in Pennsylvania in 1776? You, you bet there's probably 150,000 of them in the colony of Pennsylvania. Uh, there's another Pennsylvania, the Free Man's Journal, which is published in Philadelphia, uh, writes, uh, informs its readers in November 1776 that many of our officers who saw them say they are ugly as devils. This reaches into every corner of the United States. Vosmus, whom I already quoted, is taken prisoner at the Battle of Bennington, which is actually in Bloomsuck, New York, but Bennington was faster, claiming this battle site. And when he is, is marching across Massachusetts into Boston as a prisoner of war, he says that, uh, that uh, Bay Staters, Mass people of Massachusetts, I'm quoting, looked as us, at us with the same intense curiosity as the people in Germany when the first rhinoceros arrived there. Uh, and, and then when he's in Williamstown, uh, Massachusetts in August 1777 and again I quote him our landlady had a child nine months old that she was carefully hiding and I was curious to know the reason but I was very much humiliated by my curiosity because my landlady said she had heard the Germans were cannibals slaughtering children and when we expressed our astonishment about that she asked whether we had churches in our country or whether we also prayed but they believed that God was our creator and Christ our savior because she had been reliably assured that, what, that we were the savages of Germany. Again, this is it's virtually impossible, even in Bloomsburg, New York, certainly not in Boston, that they could never have seen a German speaker. Uh, but I could give you examples down from, uh, from uh, Maryland to the Vita Holy Staken prisoner and when he is at Rogers Tavern, which is on the Susquehanna, still standing, people come from near and far to look at a Hessian. And there's tons of Germans in, in Maryland, of course, and in Virginia as, as well. We are the savages of Germany. Again, it's difficult to understand that in a country where probably 250,000 German speakers, certainly the largest non-English minority at the time where a couple months of propaganda could really turn them into something that they obviously are not and convince people that, yeah, maybe the folks in Lancaster County are, you know, they're human and the rest what's coming now are just devils or uh, what have you. The Hessians didn't know much, certainly the enlisted men, about the New World. How do they react by what they learn and see here in the New World? It is served by the thousands because they like it. And after the end of the war, they actually get permission to stay if they want to because they had been pulled from the lowest, uh, from the poorest parts of the population. And the Landgrass was very happy for every poor person that stayed here in, in, in the Americas. Uh, how, uh, how, how uh, ever, could I have the next uh, slide, please? However, the image of the Hessian as a savage, mercenary, etc., is perpetuated into the 19th century through uh, uh, images like that. 
is confirmed and strengthened uh, through two, two world wars, that image of the, of the savage German, Hessian, etc. And it's, and it's uh, while it's not uh, applied to Germans uh, as a whole anymore, I can attest to that, uh, in the, the Hessian that comes here during the War of Independence is still connected with images such as that. Okay, let's go to the French, to a, a uh, uh, not, not quite yet. Uh, let's go to the French, uh, a group of people who comes, who is invited to come over here. Where do those animosities come from? I mean, and being anti-Catholic is also part of, of British culture. Uh, but dating back to the days of Henry VIII, the Act of Supremacy, we've all heard of Mary, Queen of Scots, the Catholic King, etc. But these are all domestic affairs that the British fight out more or less uh, uh, bloodily amongst themselves. The big change in which it comes in, six, in the 1680s, 1685, the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, and the Huguenots have to leave France. And then 1688, the Glorious Revolution, Charles II, the Catholic King is deposed in favor of, of William and, uh, and Mary, William being the Dutch, uh, Dutch uh, Protestant. And uh, as Louis XIV is seen as an expansionist, violent Catholic ruler, uh, England and Britain very quickly, certainly by the time of the War of the Spanish Succession, become arch enemies until really 1815 and Waterloo, when you know, Napoleon is defeated uh, once, once again. In order to, to uh, uh, buttress this, uh, this animosity, it's not just religion that's being used, but everything, manners, eating habits, political system, what have you, anything that can serve that purpose of portraying the French as the enemy in this struggle is being used. And here, uh, thank you for this, here we see one of these propaganda pamphlets that comes out talking about the true English and, and uh, uh, damnable doctrines, popish successes, bloodthirsty, cruel massacres, etc. And you see, look at the dates, this is exactly at this time period when George I becomes King of England because William and Mary don't have any children. And the fear that England might get a Catholic ruler and or that Louis XIV might get involved in this election is so strong that this kind of propaganda sweeps across England and stays and stays there. And this vitriolic hatred that we have in England throughout the early part of the, uh, of the 18th century uh, bears fruit. If we can see the next uh, book title, please, or the next slide. This book by Montbrun, uh, published in 17, uh, whatever, I can, yeah. Uh, he, he talks about, uh, about his experiences when in, when in France, and what he basically says is that France, the, the French, we are the only nation in the universe that the English do not despise. Uh, they rather do us the honor of hating us with all the heartiness possible. Their aversion against us is a sentiment with which they inculcate from the cradle before they know that there is a God to be worshipped, that is, that there are Frenchmen to be detested. And, and he has lots of examples in his book then about, uh, about how this anti-French, anti-Catholic uh, uh, sentiments have become now, at least so he claims, part of the English character. It is not surprising, of course, that when Englishmen come to the New World, particularly to New England, that they take this cultural baggage with them. A cultural baggage that's already there from the beginning, with the, with the Puritans, this anti-Catholicism, anti-established church, etc., and they take this with them. And this anti-French sentiments grow in the New England colonies in particular throughout the 18th century in continuous warfare with the French Catholic neighbors up in Canada, for example. 
And uh, the French and Indian War is only over in 1763. This goes on for more than half of the century. And throughout the 18th century, uh, ministers in particular uh, encourage repatriated prisoners uh, to publish their accounts, which are then very often read from the pulpits of the churches. And these accounts are invariably uh, anti-French, anti-Catholic, and if I may quote a fellow historian, confirm the long-standing Protestant tradition that links the Catholic Church with violence, tyranny, immorality, theological error. And the next slide, please. Uh, here is one of these, uh, these anti-French cartoons, and it's uh, interesting if you read this, uh, following the passage of the Quebec Act, June 1774, every single issue of this uh, Newport uh, newspaper carries an anti-French reference uh, until March 1775, and that's just before, just before uh, Lexington and Concord. And now the next slide, uh, please because it's not just uh, violence, tyranny, immorality, and theological error. It, of course, also includes frog eating, as you can see here at the bottom here of, of, this, uh, of this cartoon of 1756. And, uh, and uh, you know, you see the, the Dominican, uh, which the name of this religious order is intentionally misrepresented as Dominicanus, the hounds of the, of the, of the Lord, etc. And these are the uh, are cartoons uh, that you see in English as well as, of course, New England American, American newspapers. Same question that I asked with the Hessians. Do Americans really believe that? How can they not? First of all, uh, especially in New England, this is an English stock. They bring their cultural baggage with them. We got the French and Indian Wars, the, uh, conflicts with Canada, and they believe everything. Let me just give you one example from the May of 1781, just when French forces uh, have been here for a while, when French officers are served a real frog dinner by Nathaniel Fry who is the owner of today's Longfellow House uh, in Boston in there. This occasion is on May 8, May 1781, when Tracy, the owner at the time, made a great feast for the Admiral and his officers, and, and he says, my father was one of the guests, and told me that two large tureens of soup were placed at the ends of the table. The Admiral, that's Barra, who just come, said that the right of Tracy and Monsieur de Letomp, who is the ambassador of the council, rather, is on the left. Tracy filled a plate with soup, which went to the Admiral, and the next was handed to the council. But as soon as Letomp put his spoon into his plate, he fished up a large frog, just as green and perfect as if he had hopped from the pond in the Turin. Not knowing what he was, he seized it by one of his, its hind legs, and holding it up in view of the whole company, discovered that he was a full-grown frog. As soon as he had thoroughly inspected it, he made himself sure of the matter. He exclaimed, Mon Dieu, a grenouille, my lord, it's a frog. And then turning to the gentleman next to him, gave him the frog, and this frog is then passed around. And as other people get their plates, everyone has a frog uh, in it. And Mr. Tracy, uh, uh, keeping his ladle going, was wondering what, they, what this laughter meant, and raising his head, why don't they eat them if they knew the confounded trouble I had to catch them in order to treat them to a dish of their own country. Uh, Mr. Tracy is uh, one of the wealthiest people in Boston. He is in the Caribbean trade. Uh, surely he, he met, and we know he had contact with French uh, traders in the West Indies, Nevertheless, he was convinced that to do them, if he wanted to do them a favor, you have to serve them live frogs. Catholicism, uh, anti-French, uh, etc., uh, is prevalent even after the French get here. Uh, James Dana, who is the pastor of the First Church in Wallingford, in Connecticut in a sermon preached in May 1779, 
that's a year after the signing of the Treaty of Friendship and Amity reminds our legislators that the pre preservation of our religion depends on the continuance of a free government. Let our allies have their eyes open on the blessings of such a government and they will at once renounce their Catholic superstitions. On the other hand, should we lose our freedom, this will prepare the way to the introduction of popery. And down in Pennsylvania, you get a minister says, the French have landed. If we don't swear allegiance to the King of France, the soldiers are not going to come and stab us all to death. This is the context in which Rochambeau's forces come in July of 1780. And as you can imagine, it was not a very friendly cultural context into which they step when they get here. They only get here when the Continental Congress and the Continental Army knows no other way of saving, of solving this war, of preserving the American struggle for independence. Uh, even John Adams uh, 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 once said in 1776, I'm not fond of English or French tyranny, though if I must have one, I should prefer the last. I don't want a French army here, but I want to have one employed against Britain. The French can be our, our allies as long as they stay away. We don't really want to have them here, but by the spring of 1780, that's not an option anymore. Uh, so they, uh, they eventually will come and eventually will stop ashore in Newport. And they get exactly uh, the kind of reception that I just talked about. Just one example, uh, Clermont Crèvecoeur, who's an, uh, an artillery lieutenant, wrote that the English, he couldn't say the Americans do that, but the English had made the French seem odious to the Americans, saying that we were dwarfs, pale, ugly spec specimens who lived exclusively on frogs and snail. There you have it. Uh, uh, Ezra Stiles, who's the president of Yale, so a fairly well-educated person, I would think, uh, writes in August 1780, when he actually meets French soldiers for the first time and French officers, he writes to a friend, uh, neither officers nor men are the effeminate beings we were heretofore taught to believe them. They're as large and as likely men as can be produced by any nation. If you want to go down to Virginia, there's Colonel Fontaine uh, of the French, of the Virginia militia. He meets a French soldiers for the first time in October 1781 during the siege of Yorktown and he writes to the French, the, uh, writes, the French are very different from the ideas formerly inculcated in us of a people living on frogs and coarse vegetables. <laughs> a finer troops I never saw. Here you see that, that these preconceived notions of what the French are like are colony-wide and they're all the same and how, how personal uh, experience actually meeting them uh, says, well, you know, they got ten fingers, they got two eyes, and they, they just they really look like other fellow human beings in here. A perfect example, though, where long-standing prejudice, I mean, this goes, it's almost a hundred years old by the time Rochambeau's forces get here, how they are at least temporarily corrected by personal experience by seeing the people that we, uh, that we uh, talk about. Uh, French enlisted men knew just about as much about America as the Hessians did. Uh, they do not desert in large numbers, and the reason for that is obvious. A loyal uh, American patriot will turn in a Hessian, and will turn a Frenchman? No. A loyal patriot will not turn in a Hessian uh, unless he gets money from the, from the American government, but he will certainly turn in a, a, a French deserter. And if you are a Frenchman and you desert in Pennsylvania, for example, your support group that says, why don't you come, I'll hide you, is how large? Zero. If you're a Hessian or 
one of the German speakers in Rochambeau's army, and you desert in Pennsylvania, your support group is how large? You name it. In Rochambeau's forces in the Royal Dupont Regiment, the von Zweibrücken, which is in the Palatinate, uh, one enlisted man says half of the half of the regiment found friends and relatives that had had immigrated to the United States during the 1750s and 1760s. French soldiers know very little about the uh, the country that they are going to go to. Uh, and some of them desert, but not very many. There simply are no French-speaking communities where they could find temporary home, temporary support. Because the French-speaking communities that are over here, down in Mamaroneck, for example, is who? These are French Huguenots. They are not, they very well remember why Grandpa had to leave France. They are not going to give any support to a soldier of the King of France who represents the Catholicism, the tyrannical regime, etc., that their ancestors had fled. And there's a number of, uh, of examples and comments by French officers. Nevertheless, French officers thought they knew the new world they're, gonna go, they're going to see. And this image of the new world that they are going to see is what? It's the image created by the French Enlightenment, by the philosophe, the wilderness over here, the place where, where, the new, uh, where the old world can renew itself, like a tabula rasa for a, for a Rousseau comes to mind, a meal, etc. And just one example, uh, the Comte de Lombardier, who is 21 years old, has a, a couple of pages in his diary, his journal, in sort of a stream of consciousness, uh, where he writes that when he talks about New England, within their families, nothing can trouble them. They display a happy air about them, these New Englanders quietly work their fields, their charming daughters meet the concept that people have formed of shepherdesses, which one does not encounter in Europe anymore outside pastoral plays, etc. Happiness seems the destiny of these lands, but Europeans who have discovered this vast continent have soiled it with your discretions and introduced the caprice, the morals of Europe. He seems to forget that the New Englanders are also European immigrants. But be that as it may, when he talks about the caprice, the morals of Europe, one of them uh, that he talks about and which has become a preconceived notion of New England Yankers, Yankees is that love of money. Axel von Fersen, for example, he writes in January 1781, the spirit of patriotism only exists in the chief and principal men of the country who are making great sacrifices. The rest make up the great mass who think only of their personal interest. Money is the controlling idea and the actions. Money is their God. Virtue, honor, all count for nothing to them compared with the precious metal. But here we too, we see how he, how people like Ferson, who are independently wealthy, would call it today, would think, well, these Americans are all virtuous and for the sake of liberty and high ideals and all men are created equal. They serve for free and give up everything for this ideal of liberty. Well, sorry, uh, you know, you can't eat ideals. These people all want to live. And when the French are here with gold and silver and the Americans are here with paper money that's worthless, guess what, right? You go for the gold or silver. Uh, because that's worth something. It doesn't even matter whether the King of France is in there on, the, on there or the King of England or the King of Spain, silver is silver. You know, it's like your American Express card. Don't leave home without it. So there's another, uh, another component, then I'll, I'll stop, where these French officers are yeah, cured in a way of their high ideals that they have of this tabula rasa from the Enlightenment. Ideals which Hessian officers actually never really express. And that is when it comes to the makeup of society. It's one thing to say they're all equal and they're working their fields, etc. And then you actually encounter this 
New England society is a society of composed largely of equals. Uh, Hector St. John de Cref Coeur, for example, uh, defines an American as someone who has left behind him all his ancient prejudices and manners, who is someone who saw no reason to, de to defer to anyone because he wore epaulets and hide, hi had a title of nobility. That may be true, but then there's a French nobleman who wants something, and this New Englander is going to say, as the uh, Chevalier de Coriolis says, here it is not like it is in Europe, where when the troops are on the march, you can take horses, you can take wagons, you can issue billets for lodging, and with the aid of a gendarme, overcome the difficulties an inhabitant might make. In America, the people say they are free, and if a proprietor who doesn't like the look of your face tells you he doesn't want to lodge you, you must go seek lodging elsewhere because the words, I don't want to end the business, there's no means of appeal. Well, excuse me, I'm a count or something. What do you mean? No. So they, they, have, they get a lesson of virtuous or not virtuous Americans, but certainly of New England society, uh, what this is like. When preconceived notions of you think you go and ex uh, experience and reality clash, reality wins, obviously, in there. Uh, reality uh, uh, does, does win. Okay, here's just a cartoon of, a uh, British cartoon, obviously, of Rochambeau's forces, uh, you know, dandies uh, with your long cues and what have you. Okay, where do we stand? Where do we stand? Hessian savages, frog-eating frog Frenchmen and virtuous American. Uh, how personal experiences change time-honored perceptions. Is it true? To a certain degree it is. I gave you some examples of uh, personal experiences turn pale, ugly Frenchmen into finer troops I never saw, or, uh, or Hessians, uh, mm, yeah, are still described as savages and brutes, even though reality should have told them they look just like you and I. It's, uh, you know, the point I'm trying to make is Generalizations don't work in this context. You have to look at it situational, why they are here. How about in the long term? Uh, somehow, I think the image of the dandy, skinny Frenchman eating frog legs and snails may be there somewhere, somehow among us. Because somehow this love-hate relationship that England has had for 300 years with France, and still has to a certain degree, right, has also become part of American yeah, culture, whatever you want to use it. And again, that's not surprising. Once the war is over, the War of Independence is over, a couple of years later, there's the French Revolutionary War, there's Robespierre, there's the guillotine, there's Napoleon. Remember what Washington said, beware of foreign alliances, you know, but if you close yourself off, then you stick with your own set of cultural values, and they survive uh, for a long, for a long time. Somehow, this this love-hate relationship that the English have had with the French and still do, still do, uh, is still there. You know, these people who can't fight their way out of a paper bag. We had to rescue them twice in the wars already, and whatever. You, some of you may even remember freedom fries. How about the Hessians? Uh, thousands of Hessians, as I said, stay in the United States after the war. And while the Hessians themselves are, uh, uh, are still these mercenaries, I think that image, uh, image of the Germans has changed somewhat. One set of perceptions is, this old, uh, is a century old by the time French forces step uh, Sure, the others brand new in 1776. Both, however, whether it's 1680 or 1776, are set of preconceptions which to a large degree are created for political purposes 
and are used or abused for numerous purposes. And once established, these preconceived notions, these ideas we have about other peoples, in plural, uh, tend to be very long lived. Can personal experiences change time honored perceptions? Yes, they can, but it takes a great personal effort. Thank you very much. Thank you.